It gives me great pleasure this evening to welcome Jane Bauer, who's going to speak to us. Jane is a very versatile person. She's a teacher, an author, and an actress. For many years, she worked in the Department of Education at the University of Cambridge. It would take me the full hour to read out everything she's achieved. So let me just mention that among many other things, she devised and presented the celebration of Joyce Grenfell. So it's great pleasure to welcome you this evening, Jane, and we all look forward with eager anticipation to your talk. So over to you, Jane. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is to share my screen and just check that we get this correct. And I think you should now be able to see the title of my talk. Um, welcome, everybody. It's very nice to be talking to people from my birth town, um, even though I'm sitting in Cambridge to speak to you. My talk is called, obviously, Sandstone in My Blood, and by the end of it, I hope you'll see why I chose that title. I'm going to begin with a poem. And so, my dear, you've come back at last. I always fancied you would. Well, you see, the old home of your childhood's days is standing where it stood. The roses still clamber from porch to roof. The elder is white at the gate. And over the long, smooth gravel path, the peacock still struts in state. On the gabled lodge, as of old in the sun, the pigeons sit and coo. And our hearts, my dear, are no whit more changed, but have kept still warm for you. Well, this is the 11th of a 25 verse poem by the poet laureate Alfred Austin. Here he is. And I always wonder whether he has in mind his own childhood home, because it happened to be mine as well. Though no peacocks featured in my day, there was indeed a long, smooth gravel path, roses, elder, and pigeons aplenty. Along with our parents, surely the home where we were brought up is one of the most powerful influences we can experience. There's no doubt in my mind that my first home has helped shape many of my passions tastes and interests. I dream of it still, I dwell on it, I'm nostalgic for it, I seek out novels and films that have its flavour, and I hope to put over some of my fascination to you. Well, the house I'm talking about is this one, Ashwood. It stands hidden by a high wall and trees in Headingley Lane in Leeds, directly opposite the former Leeds Girls High School, which is my former school. For anyone not familiar with Headingley, it's now a thriving, lively community of shops, housing and student accommodation. Headingley Lane is the A660, leading directly to Leeds University and the city centre three miles away. But at the time this house was built, Headingley was green countryside, an escape from the smoke and grime of Leeds for many Victorian famous names who built the imposing sandstone villas which give Headingley its unique character today. We, that is my father Len Bower, my mother Sadie and myself, knew this house as Ashwood and the blackened sandstone gateposts are still carved with that name. But in Alfred Austin's autobiography, the one photograph of the house is labelled Headingley. So here's the page from his autobiography, and you can see that he's given the dates there when he says he lived there. Now, I thought perhaps that the photo is simply labelled with the name of the location. But Austin says that when his father, Joseph, a Leeds wool stapler, that is a dealer in wool, when his father had the house built, it was the first villa in Headingley. 
On either side, he says, were cornfields and Woodhouse Moor. So is it possible that the villa itself was named Headingley? Austin speaks of a bishop who was, quote, a frequent guest at Headingley, suggesting that this was the name of the house. You might like to keep in mind the dates beneath this picture, 1835 to 1857. Well, you might imagine it was with fascination and eagerness that I obtained the two volumes of Alfred Austin's autobiography after a search on the web. I'm a voracious reader, but two more turgid tomes I have yet to tackle. I do apologise to any Austin admirers who might be listening, but I found his factual, unemotional, impersonal style and very noticeable ego hard going. And I was hugely disappointed at the lack of detail in his one chapter on his childhood. Apart from one, he doesn't even name his own siblings. So if we look them up on the census entries, they show that Mr. and Mrs. Austin, who were Roman Catholic and were called Joseph and Mary, um, had in 1841, five children living with them in total. So here's a, a page from the census there. There's all the little Austins listed there. So if you go to the family tree on another document, that actually shows that they had an older daughter, Catherine, as well, the firstborn. Notice that um, Joseph Austin's name is um, crossed out and um, above it, it says um, in tradence. Now, an expert who helped me says that this was apparently an archaic expression, even in 1841. And it suggests that the use of that phrase suggests that it was recorded by an elderly census taker who also made the error in the first place of writing Joseph's name in when he was actually away from home. Note that uh, Mary's age is given here as 30, that's his wife. Then we have Henry born in 1833, but that's a mistake. He was actually born in 1836. Winifred, 1834, but it was actually 1833. Alfred himself, born in 1835. Walter in 1841. And uh, in the next census, we find little Mary um, at the bottom. There she is, um, born in 1844 and named after her mother. Now, Mary Senior's age, as we've just seen, was given as 30 in 1841, but as 45 um, only 10 years later. So all this shows how many mistakes we're dealing with in um, census entries. Um, census takers were instructed to round adults' ages up or down to the nearest five, but this still doesn't make sense in this case. And it's one of the many examples of either human error or maybe false information that I've found on various censuses, which makes it very frustrating. The expert I consulted said, it's not unusual for the ages to be unreliable in 1841. It's unlikely that the enumerator would question a wife if her husband was away. He probably asked a servant how old the uh, master and mistress were, and that would probably be a guess. So notice as well that the Austin's address on this bit of the census is given as Headingley Lane. Well, we can glean a little about the house from volume one, chapter one of the autobiography. Alfred Austin was born in 1835, and to just um, get the feel of that um, that's the same year that Charlotte Bronte would be 19. He says the house had been built by his father shortly after his marriage. So here's his father, Joseph Austin. Now his parents' marriage took place in January 1829 
and the first child, Catherine, came along in November that year. Alfred Austin states that he was born there. Remember the date under the photo of the house was 1835, which was the year of his birth. I have no reason to disbelieve him, but the facts have proved hard to pin down. And here I'm indebted to my father Len for his rigorous research into the history of the house. His passion for it matched my own. So dad uh, provided maps. The first one is dated 1834. Now this shows the plot of Ashwood in pink. Can you see the tiny little pink rectangle there? And at the moment it has no house on it as you can see. But intriguingly, tea gardens behind it. How I would have loved to see what those were like. Well, this map explains how Alfred Austin could have seen Woodhouse Moor from the house. Nowadays, that is unimaginable. Houses, roads, traffic and shops extend for a mile or more between Ashwood and the Moor. But this map shows that then there was absolutely nothing in between and the Moor extended far further towards the house than it does today. Um, I've also got this paper, which claims that Ashwood was built in 1841. That's the little spidery writing to the left there. Somebody has written Ashwood built 1841. Um, but by then, Alfred Austin would be six. So that feels far too late. Well, I'd been puzzling over just when Ashwood might have been built when I came across a newspaper article of October 1953. And this is what I found, um, in which the journalist um, C. Clive Murray says, um, he talks about over 30 years ago, so he would have been talking about the 1920s. The late Frank Kidson, who was a Leeds man and a collector of English folk tunes. The Lake Frank Kidson drew the attention of readers of the Yorkshire Evening Post to the record in the directory for 1837, two years after Alfred's birth, that Joseph Austin, his prosperous wool stapler, stapler father, was still living at an earlier Leeds home in Blundell Place a row of five red brick houses with gardens in front, which you will now seek in vain. Well, let's turn to Kelly's directory, see if that sheds any light. So if we look at this, this is 1834. We do in fi uh, indeed find um, Austin Joseph Woolstapler there at three Blundell Place. Kidson says he was still there in 1837. By 1839, the directory here gives Austin as living in Headingley again. There it is in italics in the middle. The small h, by the way, means a home or a habitation. And this again seems to suggest that Headingley was the house's accepted name. However, when I looked up my own family in Kelly's directory, I was dismayed to find so many errors in the facts given there. Uh, we are still listed at living at Ashwood long after we had all left. And according to a librarian, this too is a common occurrence. So it's by no means certain when the Austins first moved into Ashwood. I looked also at Pevsner's Architectural Guide to Leeds. He gives the date of Ashwood as 1836, but unfortunately I've discovered that that book too contains a number of errors. And then we have Austin's claim that Ashwood was the first villa in Headingley. Well, that's an ambiguous statement. He does not mean the first villa built in Headingley. He means the first villa you come to in Headingley as you approach it from Leeds. 
So let's take a look at some old plans of Headingley, a village as it then was. So here we have a map of 1822. Very little there, apart from the main kite area. And the main sort of road that you can see across the map is Headingley Lane, of course. So no sign of Ashwood there. Then we have 1834, when you can see that little dotted um, patch, the oblong patch in the middle of Headingley Lane is where Ashwood was going to be. And then a close up of that patch is Austin's land. Note the Hargreaves estate is next to it on the left. And then we can see a map of 1839. A little more going on. Well, we can see that the maps show many other buildings in that area before 1837. Some of these could certainly be described as villas. And indeed, in the photograph in his autobiography, if we just look at that again, the next door villa number 50 Headingley Lane is already present on the extreme left of the picture. This was the house owned by William Hargreaves built on the land that Joseph Austin had sold him. But Ashwood was indeed the first villa that you would come to at that time, though later many other fine sandstone villas were built between it and Woodhouse Moor, as we shall see. Well, let's now look at a map of 1851. There's the pink area again where Ashwood is, but we can't, uh, we can see the house, that little black blob halfway up the left hand side of the pink oblong. There's the house, but we can't see the coach house or the billiard room. Now, were they um, simply not marked on the map or were they built later? 13 years seems far too long a time for a man of Joseph Austin's status to wait for a coach house in which to keep his carriages, though outbuildings do seem to be marked on other surrounding houses on this map. However, another expert told me that outbuildings were often not recorded on maps of this kind. Another reason that Austin would have been able to see Woodhouse more from Ashwood is that the house was built on what was then known as Headingley Hill, an area higher, as you might imagine, than the surrounding land. And there, a lot of you will recognise Headingley Hill Church, um, which used to have Moreland School next door to it. So Headingley Hill became the name of the church, which still stands on Headingley Lane next to Ashwood, the church which I attended from the age of five until I left home at 18, and then every holiday until it closed in the late 1970s. And you will probably know that it's at present derelict and sprayed with graffiti. Alfred Austin says that Ashwood, or as he always referred to it, Headingley, was, quote, thoroughly in the country, no other house intervening between it and the farther side of Woodhouse Moor. He and his unnamed brothers and sisters had adjoining meadows to play in, but little Austin could watch the cavalry executing what he calls their somewhat elementary manoeuvres on Woodhouse Moor from their lawn. Austin got a pony at the age of six, so there must have been stabling in Ashwood then, in 1841, which isn't marked on that 1851 map. Alfred Austin says he rode down to watch the cavalry at close quarters, fell off and was picked up by Prince George, Queen Victoria's cousin, who let him ride beside him for the rest of the morning. Well, back to the house. Now, in case you're thinking that my parents were affluent enough to have bought a former stately home as soon as they were married, I must make it clear that by the time they lived there in the early 1950s, the house had been converted into four rented flats. 
and it was in one of these that my parents first lived. Austin says in his autobiography that every day began with morning prayers led by his father in the breakfast room. It's not clear which room the breakfast room was. Let's have a look at the ground floor plan in Austin's time. So as you see, it doesn't actually say breakfast room. It could have been the dining room, I suppose, but they may have had breakfast in the drawing room. I don't know. The parlour, incidentally, was a splendid chamber and many of its features were retained. In my day, it was part of flat one and it was known as the mahogany room. On the rare occasions that I, as a child, caught a glimpse of it, I recall gleaming dark panels and skirtings of polished wood. They are still there. The drawing room became part of flat one and retains its wonderful stained glass windows and richly elaborate plaster work. And here it is today, still there. I remember it well because I had to sleep there. This was not our flat, it was the neighbour's flat, but I was sent downstairs to sleep there when my mother went into labour with my brother in our flat upstairs. And after all that palaver, he wasn't born until nine days later. Note the drawing room windows marked, uh, not the bay window, um, the two matching ones at the bottom. If you look at this photo, um, it shows those drawing room windows blocked in. Can you see on the left there of the building? That's how I knew it. And um, it's how they remain to this day. This is a side view of the house. Joseph Austin, Alfred's father, was a magistrate in Leeds, though he declined the office of mayor more than once. Alfred digresses for several pages of his autobiography onto the life of his uncle. And if you'll forgive me, I'll just digress too. Um, the uncle was Joseph Locke, the highly regarded railway engineer whose statue stands in Locke Park in Barnsley. Alfred then mentions his nursery governess, Anne Ingleson, and his much loved nurse, Mary Wilkinson who apparently used to say of the little Alfred, he shall be king of all England, he shall. Neither of these ladies appears on the census of 1841, though several other servants do appear. Alfred would be six then. And I wonder if they were part of the household at Blundell Place or whether they had been dismissed by 1841. It seems unlikely that both of them would be away when the census was taken. If they were at Ashwood, as Austin implies, it's strange to think of their words being uttered in the rooms I knew so well as a child, along with his father's favourite phrases, which were apparently fair play and honour bright. I like to think that the echoes of those phrases were embedded as sound waves in the black sandstone of the walls. Well, then we have another intriguing sentence in the, the autobiography. I quote, At night, I used to steal as quietly as I could out of my bed and creep into the day nursery, from the window of which could be seen the rising of the moon or the afterglow of the sunset in summer. It was my father who worked out that the window he referred to must be that of the bedroom that I had as a child. If we look here, um, it's the bedroom uh, to the left. You see the big um, oriel window, the bay window sticking out on the first floor. Um, the window directly to the right of that uh, was my bedroom. He worked this out because not only did the sun set in that direction, um, but there were still holders on either side of the window on the inside, which would have held bars to prevent a young child climbing out onto the stone 
balcony immediately outside. Um, this, by the way, my own brother once did at the age of two and had to be lured in through the window by my mother with, uh, by waving a bar of chocolate. Alfred cherished what he called an indefinable feeling for a girl at his day school. And they arranged between them that whoever started for school first in the morning would place a stone outside our garden gate as a token. My father told me that he always thought of this whenever he saw Ashwood's gate, which is the gate with Ashwood carved on the two gateposts there that you can still see on Headingley Lane. Next time you go past, have a look for the word Ashwood on each of them. Though the 1950s wooden gate here, which is the one I remember, um, and was seven feet in height, has uh, been replaced with an equally large wrought iron one. This was the same gateway that I passed through each morning when I walked up to my own infant school, Springbank, and later my junior school, Bennett Road. And we think that must be the gate where Alfred left the stone for his little lady love. I've mentioned that in my day, Ashwood comprised four rented flats. So here's the ground floor plan as I knew it. Um, this was made in 1947. And here is the first floor plan. So you can see that curving staircase in the centre of both. Now, my parents rented flat three. If you um, see the ink blot there, um, that is Alfred's day nursery, my bedroom. And note the bay window sticking out right at the bottom there. And also the mention of the replacement oriel window. Um, that wasn't there in Austin's day, and it doesn't feature in the photo of the house at that time. But it is shown on this drawing. There's the very ornate oriel window that was put in later, not quite sure why. And you can see the bay window of our living room here. This is at the back of the property. Um, and I'll return to uh, that, uh, a rather unusual feature of that later on. The little entry of the flat at the bottom there is flat four. Ours was flat three above flat four. Paperwork shows that my parents paid £8, 15 shillings and fivepence per month in 1954, rising to a heady £10 and fivepence by 1959. I recently looked up Ashwood on Google and was astonished to find myself staring at photos of the interior of our flat, vastly altered but still recognisable which was now for rent at £196 per week. Sadly, the images were not available to reproduce here, but you will see more of the flats later. Ashwood is believed by some, but not proved, to have been designed by a distinguished Leeds architect, Robert Dennis Chantrell, who designed Leeds Parish Church. The entrance has similar motifs to others of Chantrell's, similar doorways and pairs of octagonal towers. We also know that Chantrell was commissioned to design a house on Headingley Lane. I do like to think that it's Ashwood. But again, opinions vary. And here is part of a handwritten list of architects from the Ashwood files. This says that Ashwood was built by George Nettleton, the same architect as six other local buildings, including Headingley Hill Church. But we know that this church was definitely designed by Cuthbert Broderick, designer of Leeds Town Hall. Maddeningly, there is a piece of sellotape right at the top there over the first name, 
but it looks as if it might begin with a J. Headingley Castle listed here was designed by John Child. And if we look at Headingley Castle, it really does resemble Ashwood very strikingly. And Pevsner's Architectural Guide to Leeds gives Ashwood's architect as John Child. But I can tell that the name under the piece of sellotape is not Child. Another possible name put forward by people is John Clark. The fact is, we don't know who designed and built Ashwood. Very frustrating. Well, whoever designed it, Alfred Austin lived at Ashwood until he was 20 years old. He became a political journalist and a barrister. He twice stood for Parliament, unsuccessfully, and was Poet Laureate for 17 years, chiefly because William Morris turned down the role and Swinburne was deemed unsuitable because, Gladstone said, of the turbulency of his political opinions. Perhaps unwisely in an article, Austin stated that Browning was muddy and unmusical, the very incarnation of discordant obscurity. Browning did not take kindly to his criticisms and responded in 1876 with an article in which he lampooned Austin as a banjo Byron that twangs the strum strum. Browning also ridiculed Austin for his very short stature. Austin was just five feet tall. Browning called him quilp hopper my thumb. And in letters, he also described him as morally and intellectually a dwarf and likened him to a monkey. Well, I have always wished that the poet in whose house I grew up had penned lines of unmatched grace and beauty. But one of his most oft quoted couplets, apparently written after the illness of the Prince of Wales, is said to read, a note said to read, across the wires the electric message came, he is no better, he is much the same. Another memorable for all the wrong reasons is said to be, they rode across the veldt as fast as they could pelt. Well, I came across this letter in the Times. It's dated the 5th of May, 2009. Dear Sir, I am glad that in your leading article of May the 2nd, you did not join in the generally ignorant execration of Alfred Austin, the Poet Laureate. The best known couplet ascribed to him is in fact an anonymous parody, supposedly on the subject of the sickness of the Prince of Wales in 1871. Flashed from his bed, the electric tidings came, he is no better, he is much the same. These lines were popularised by E.F. Benson, who preferred a good story to accuracy. Nor, sir, did Austin write the jangling couplet said to occur in his first poems, Laureate. The mockers say it goes, they went across the veldt as hard as they could pelt. The truth is not quite so bad. So we forded and galloped forward as hard as our beasts could pelt, first eastward, then tending northward, right over the rolling veldt. The job of Poets Laureate is hard enough, sir, without their being blamed for lines they did not write. Well, it's indeed sad that any poet should be remembered only by some lines that may never have been his. I was delighted to discover an article by and correspond with Dr. Richard Storer, the senior lecturer at uh, at Trinity University in Leeds, senior lecturer in English, uh, who is a far greater authority on Austin than I am. And he writes, of Austin as poet and person, I think he was quite a talented political writer and an interesting example of a writer with an explicitly conservative outlook, who nevertheless revered writers like Shelley and Byron whose politics were completely opposite. 
As a poet, he was a victim of the conventions of his time. He just imitated those and never found a voice of his own. The same is probably true of most people who write poetry, and it doesn't mean it all deserves the kind of criticism he came in for. Unfortunately, his shortcomings were exposed by the series of events which led to him being identified as Tennyson's successor. Well, I've mentioned that Austin was physically very small and short, five feet in height. An article states that a Dewsbury resident, seeing his Conservative candidate for the first time, said, Eh, hey, but you're a very little un. To which Austin replied, You wait till you see my wife. Well, his wife, Hester, here she is at the time, was presumably even shorter than he was. Um, though unlike him, she didn't sport a huge handlebar moustache. Here she is in later life, adding to her height with splendid headgear. And Austin was lampooned mercilessly in political journals and cartoons. Take a look at these ones. Now that's um, a caricature at the, of the time. And then we have this one. He seems to be wearing a, a newspaper hat in that one. He was apparently known widely for being pompous and seemed to have a very high opinion of his own abilities. And this certainly comes over in his autobiography. I have found references to him as the preening Yorkshireman and the Popinjay poet. He was heavily caricatured in the 1906 children's novel John Doe and the Cherub by L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz. In it, he is called Sir Osted Alfrin and writes not very good limericks to order. And these are the only images that I've managed to find of what Austin actually looked like over the years. Oh, that's another cartoon. You can see He's called Alfred the Little on that one, and he can't reach his lyre, his poet's lyre. So here's the, um, the uh, portraits of Austin over the years with varying degrees of facial hair. Well, whatever he was like, he and I shared our childhood, 120 years apart, in the same grounds, and for a house of this size, the actual grounds are not extensive. I didn't have the surrounding fields that Austin would have known so well. But for a child, and in the 1950s, I was the only child in the whole complex at Ashwood, the grounds were sheer magic and to me seemed enormous. In the 1950s, my father, Len, who had taught art at Batley Grammar School, became a lecturer at Leeds College of Art, where he and my mother had trained and met. Students from Leeds College of Art had to undertake an architectural study as part of their course. My father's boss, Cyril Cross, suggested to one group that they take Ashwood as the focus of their study. He mentioned this one day to dad, saying what an interesting building it was. Mr. Cross had no idea that the lecturer to whom he was speaking actually lived there. Dad was delighted that someone was going to look into the history of the building. And we have photocopies of all that remains of that study. Among them is this list of the owners. Note William Hargreaves um, there. If you can see that, I think he's somewhere down at the bottom. And um, some drawings too of a few architectural details. They come from the student study and top left, you can see that ceiling that you saw in the photograph earlier. In the fifties, our landlord and the owner of the property was a man named Glenn Cop. 
and he lived in what had been the coach house just behind the main house. On his arrival, he stuck lettering reading Glen Cop on his front door, and my father assumed that Glen Cop was his chosen name for his home. Mr. Cop was a figure to be wary of, not too welcoming of children whom he saw as a threat to his manicured lawns. In the agreement signed in 1954 by my parents, I note that it states, and it has no punctuation throughout, that no poultry, pigeons, rabbits, or anything of an offensive character or an annoyance to the neighbours to be kept alive upon the premises. From a letter of my father's to the solicitors Bramham and Gale, Mr. Cop seems to have banned ball games on the lawn, the picking of flowers and the use of any clothesline. I was always told to be on my very best behaviour when in the gardens, which were Mr. Cop's pride and joy. Once, aged five, we came face to face unexpectedly in the grounds. I said hello and had a conversation with him after which he reported to my parents that I talked to it and it's really quite intelligent. Well, the grounds were truly immaculate. That's what they looked like when I lived there. Even now, certain flowers, features and fruits take me back instantly. This is where I met roses, rustic weathered log fences, shiny laurel leaves, rhododendrons, tumbling candy tuft and rockeries. My mother taught me all the names of the flowers, including the wild ones that grew in the woodland areas where rabbits ran freely. Shepherd's purse I particularly remember, with its minute heart-shaped purses holding the little seed coins. Tart, bristly gooseberries, acid on the tongue, shining red currants. Here's a photograph of Mr. Cop admiring the very hard work that he put into his uh, garden. This is where my imagination was nurtured. I drew endlessly in large scribbling pads in grassy corners. I read in sunlit dells. I daydreamed and made up stories in deep shady hollows. I explored beneath tall ancient trees in which owls hooted at night and dropped their pellets. To his credit, Mr. Cop did allow my parents to build a small sand pit under one of the ash trees, well out of sight. And here it is with me in it. And it even had its own battlements built round it, as you can see. I also had a minute section of grass just round the corner there from that pile of stones. It was about the size of an elongated single bed on which I clearly remember often lying, looking at the sun through the buttercups, dandelions and daisies. There were several separate areas to Ashwood's grounds. There was the main front garden known to us as the Big Lawn. Then around it, there were tall trees, dense laurels and woodland with a wondrous and mysterious area of undergrowth at the bottom nearest to Headingley Lane. It was full of ancient boulders and twisting paths, each of which I knew intimately. One rock I remember reminded me of a pig's nose. And then there was the little lawn. There you can see my mother and her mother-in-law, my father's mother, and me sort of rolling about on the rug there with them. That was the little lawn with the rockery and the secret seating area with a bench just behind my grandmother there. 
It was on that small lawn, sitting on the picnic rug one day, my mother noticed that the diamond from her engagement ring was missing. We all searched in vain. If it was lost there, I like to think that it lies there still, a memento among what is now thick undergrowth. And best of all, there was the small decorative wooden house with stained glass windows to which I never gained access. It looked like the gingerbread cottage and I was told that Mr. Peterson, a Danish gentleman of few words, dried his tobacco in there. Here are my parents in the 50s with me on dad's knee there. And in the background, I'm intrigued to see that, like in the first photograph, the door of the little wooden house is open. I always remember it being firmly locked. Mr. Peterson, well, Gladys and Claremont Peterson. This is my one photograph of them together. They lived in what had been the billiard hall of the Austin's home. In my day, it was known as the bungalow. It's now known as the Billiard Hall again, and my good friend Annie lives there. And it's been such a pleasure to visit her and see what I remember as the Peterson's bungalow. Like Mr. Cop, Claremont Peterson was a gardener of true skill and passion, and he could make virtually anything from wood. He grew wonderful vegetables and fruits and kept pigeons while his wife Gladys had a blue budgie named Peter, two cats called Lucas and Wuss, and later a dog called Tanya. Perhaps the bungalow did not fall under the agreement that my father had had to sign. Now for me, no history of Ashwood could be complete without the inclusion of this couple, the Petersons. Mr. Peterson, um, in my mind and in that of my father always wore one of those yellow ochre cotton working coats like a janitor though here obviously he's gardening in his working clothes and that's me in the foreground showing off my new camera that i got for my ninth birthday mr peterson was according to my father the expert in dying suede the depth and intricacy of his knowledge of which could not be exceeded. He worked independently and was widely sought after for his expertise by many universities and by other establishments throughout Europe. He also dyed suede for um, expensive yachts and boats. He never revealed the secret of his dyes, and I wonder what has happened to his formulae now. In my father, who, like my mother, was a trained illustrator and painter, Mr. Peterson found someone who shared his fascination and passion for aesthetics, perfection and craftsmanship. Mr. Peterson always said that he could dye a suede to match any petal of any flower. Dad remembers vividly a day when Mr. Peterson brought a book of suede samples home with him. One of hundreds he had, he brought it over to flat three. He opened the first page and said slowly in his broken accent, Mr. Bauer, what colour would you say this is? Black, said my father. Mr. Peterson slowly turned the suede page. And this? Black, said Dad. With great solemnity, Mr. Peterson slowly turned page after page, about 30 in all. Each piece of suede was progressively blacker. These were just some of the dyes that he created. My parents knew him for many, many years, but they were always Mr. and Mrs. Bauer and Mr. Peterson. Mrs. Peterson, in contrast, 
had a broad Leeds accent and a penchant for mispronouncing words. She once spoke to my mother about someone she knew who had wisdom beyond her years, referring to her as a very mature girl, mature to rhyme with nature, not mature. She also referred when she had a cough to feeling a bit bronical. We believed for years that Mr. Peterson's first name was Clement and that it was Mrs. Peterson's affectation to pronounce it Claremont, rather as Thora Heard used to say, Weasley. In fact, from Kelly's directory, I see that his first name was Hans. Mrs. Peterson had an affinity with animals and could cure or heal any creature. I remember a rook with a broken wing being nursed in her cork-topped bathroom linen stool. I also remember a, a squirrel named Cyril being hand-fed at her back door. Quite how she had met someone like Mr. Peterson is unclear, but they were very fond indeed of each other and we were very fond of both of them. Well, this next photo shows behind me in my silver cross pram, Mr. Cop's coach house. So that little triangular building behind the pram, that uh, was uh, the, the triangular piece was an addition onto the original coach house. In our time, Mr. Cop had the small roof extension that you see there made into a balcony and its window had one large slatted Venetian blind. Mr. Cop had seen the sample blind in the shop uh, with each slat in a different colour to show the range available at the showroom. And he had ordered that with all the colours um, in different stripes, somewhat to the incredulity of the assistant. Outside the coach house was a cobbled yard with coal houses and what used to be an old privy. There it is also with battlements like my sandpit. And these areas are all still there. There is a similar battlemented privy further up Headingley Lane, which featured on a TV programme. Um, it's near Alma Cottages. If you just walk opposite Sainsbury's, um, the battlemented privy is still evident there. Well, this next photo shows my mother and I, I'm the one with the long ponytail, making a visit to Ashwood in 1998. And the man you see there is Mr. Cop's son. And you can see the old original coach house doors that were still there. It's the same yard um, that's directly opposite uh, to the battlemented privy that you've just seen. When she was pregnant with me, my mother had a craving for Cox's orange pippins, which she consumed in huge quantities. I always say that my blood is half Cox's juice. Consequently, there were large numbers of wooden Cox's crates um, in our possession. And my father made my bedroom furniture out of wooden Cox's crates and painted them in a pleasing and unusual color combination of a soft sage green and a very pale pinkish mauve. I can still see those two colours together in my mind. The whole of flat three was very clearly the home of two artists. The lounge ceiling was painted a dark blue and featured two silver stick on paper stars, which were stuck on by placing them once licked on the end of a broom, which was pushed against the ceiling. Dad painted two beautiful and elaborate murals on the walls. The only one I have a photograph of is this one. This shows a toy train going from Scunthorpe to Moscow. And the other was a much larger complex painting of delicate plant stems and greenery with a tiny ladybird at the bottom, especially for me to find. I always wonder if somewhere beneath the layers of wallpaper, those murals remain. My mother excelled in textiles and made every garment we wore. You can see her stunning handiwork in the Yorkshire Textile Museum, 
now housed in the university. Many of her exquisite pieces were made in Ashwood. I remember finding um, a painting or a photograph of harvest mice for her to make these applique mice on one of my dresses. They've got real glass eyes, by the way, wired in. And the bee's wings are made of lace. For me, these dresses are as much a part of Ashwood as the grounds. They are synonymous with it. They are the dresses I wore and played in there. One of the most iconic features of Ashwood is its front door, which is, I am certain, the very door that Austin would have known. We called this main entrance the big door, as opposed to the door of our flat upstairs at number three. I was absolutely amazed in the study of Ashwood that Dad's students wrote <coughs> to discover this photograph. <coughs> Excuse me, it features myself. The big door has the typical thick Victorian star patterned glass panels of the time and th the three pointed wooden motifs under it, which echoed the beautiful interior doors of our own flat. The big door was always painted black and was ruined by white plastic letters, which had been screwed on to spell Ashwood, though even these still fill me with nostalgia. They have now been removed. The push button bells, flats one to four, you can just make out in a little box to the right of the door there, uh, next to the glass panels. The door itself was too heavy for me to push open. So if I had been playing in the gardens and wanted to come back in, I pulled on a long string, which my mother hung over the stone balcony. The string was attached to a small bell in the kitchen and she would then come downstairs, 21 stairs, and open the big door to let me in. Once inside the big door, I had another play area. For the old entrance hall, pillared, gloomy and cool, had a mosaic floor. There's the student's drawing of it. And here it is. And I remember so clearly this sweeping design on it, which would certainly have been um, the one that little Austin knew. I can still hear and feel the hiss of my wooden tops metal point, which I spent hours whipping with a little leather whip until it would trip on the small unevenness on one of the mosaic pieces. The back of the big door had a massive hinge, which once stopped me in my tracks in shock, as from a certain angle, it looked like a little old man's face. From the surrounding cupboards, all painted brown and varnished, like the skirting you see here, to look like wood grain, came mysterious ticking noises in the silence. I later discovered that these were the gas meters and they had a sinister quality, which added an extra frisson of delight. There were two niches, you can just make them out on the right and left of this photograph, one of which held an ancient framed photograph of the house with a short piece about the poet laureate, and that is still hanging in the niche today. From the mosaic hall twisted the curved staircase that we saw on the ground floor and first floor plans earlier. This is um, taken from halfway up it. Well, this is the staircase up which we had to climb to access our flat. There were 21 stairs, as I remember. I can still see the tiny patterns in the beige lino, the rubber edges of the stairs and the wood grain effect in the shiny varnish. My mother had to carry me and later my brother up these stairs, 
leaving the pram below in the entrance hall. She also carried all the shopping up them, having of course walked from the local shops with it all. It was all before the days of shopping trolleys and she had pushed it or carried it up the long gravel drive. My parents never owned a car in their lives and I remember only two at Ashwood, one of which was Mr. Copps. So inside the flat, let's look at the plan again. That was our flat three that you can see there. And inside the flat, we had coal fires, one in the bedroom, one in the living room. My father lit um, the one in the living room on his knees in the morning every single day. But the bedroom one was never used apart from the day my brother was born in 1962 when the midwife insisted that there was heat in the bedroom. I remember staring at it in amazement when I was ushered in to meet my brother. And to return to that bay window I mentioned before, the living room had the very unusual feature of a dark wooden raised platform in this bay. My father thought that the bay window and platform must have been a later addition, possibly in Edwardian times. I'm not sure of the purpose of adding a platform to a flat conversion, though I don't know what its original purpose would have been either. It was still there in the estate agent's photo of some years ago, as were the decorative wooden panels on the interior doors, which I'd totally forgotten but recognised immediately. By today's standards, our rooms were very small, yet somehow our living room also housed an upright piano which Dad said was carried up the curved staircase. The kitchen was minute and very narrow. You can see it at the bottom there between the two bedrooms. It was very similar to that that you would find in a caravan or camper van today. It had a mangle and my mother would wring out the handmade clothes and hang them on a wooden clothes horse on the balcony, the same balcony you can see outside there from which the bell string hung. There was a black Bakelite telephone in a small niche just at the kitchen door with a twisted brown cloth covered flex. And I, of course, remember our number, Leeds 57658. I can still hear my mother's voice saying it as she picked up the receiver. On the way to the bathroom, at the top left there, there was a cupboard for towel, uh, towels and bedding. And dad had painted a portrait of a clown who we all called Peppy. Now I have a strong dislike of clowns, but this clown was kindly, weary and very lovable. For some reason, however, in our flat at Ashwood, Peppy was relegated to the inside of the bathroom cupboard door from whence he would smile gently out from the warmth of the towels within when the door was opened. You may be unsurprised to learn that his benign face can now be found on the inside of my airing cupboard door. Here he is. The bathroom in flat three had been enlivened by dad's painting the bath side panel primrose yellow covered in little black handprints the size of mine at the time. The only bathroom heating was a paraffin heater, black, freestanding and cylindrical, which said Beatrice on the front. So that's what we called her. The smell of Beatrice accompanied my winter baths. And when I was older, I was sent up Headingley Lane to the garage, now the dry cleaners, to buy paraffin to feed Beatrice. But what of Ashwood between Austin's time and my own? Through many emails with Anthony Ram of Leeds Central Library, who's been such a help in compiling this talk, I had managed to enthuse him with a fascination for Ashwood. And one day, while whizzing at speed through pages of microfiche, for something else entirely. Somehow his eye caught the flash of the word Ashwood 
and he backtracked and he found this priceless gem. Alfred Austin died in 1913 and um, I seem not to have got in front of me the printout that I carefully made of that newspaper article. So I'll try to read it to you. I was thrilled to read about the fight to preserve a poet's home for Ashwood Headingley Lane in Leeds was my late husband's family home. He lived at Ashwood from being a small boy. His father, Mr. Henry A. Watson, bought it, and I have known it since 1924, when I married Mr. Reginald F. Watson. Both were directors of the family business, Tunstall and Leeds Bridge. I fear that the distinguished slice of cake building, as it was well known, may come down to make new roadways. Um, and she goes on to say that it had a lovely oak gate in the nursery where Alfred Austin, the poet laureate, slept as a child. Uh, my father-in-law died in January 1940. The house was empty for a time and then requisitioned by the army. Um, and it was in a sad state when the men came out. So I hadn't realised that the house was um, used by the army in the war years. Um, and then it mentions Mr. Cop, who brought, bought Ashwood. He is a member of the Leeds Civic Trust um, and obviously cares very much for Ashwood. And the bottom is very unclear, but she goes on to say that she remembers being presented with an orchid from the hothouse in Ashwood um, by her father-in-law, uh, which she would wear in her dress to very ceremonially be taken into dinner in Ashwood. Um, and of course, I totally missed meeting this lady, which I easily could have done, Elfrida Watson. Um, she was writing this in 1971, um, but sadly died um, in Harrogate uh, some years later at a great age. What a pity that I, I never got the chance to meet her and, and hear of her memories. Well, as I said, Alfred Austin died in 1913. Before the pandemic, I inquired into having a blue plaque placed on Ashwood saying that he had lived there. I received a polite and formal reply stating that blue plaques were only placed when people had made a significant contribution to the city or town in which they resided. No, oh, sorry, Alfred. I'm delighted that the present owner, Ian Whitaker, has lovingly saved many of the original features of this Grade 2 listed building. Well, I walked recently after my father's death at the age of 100, up to Ashwood. Headingley Lane roars by, but once inside the gates, I am back in the safety of my childhood and the magic of the past. Though it's now inhabited by contemporary people with contemporary lifestyles, jobs and cars, its Victorian mystery remains. And to me, it will always be home. Now the little gingerbread cottage stands open to the skies and the bell rope no longer hangs over the stone balcony. And my mother's diamond may still be buried beneath once, what was once the little lawn. Nothing remains of my sand pit and garden, but the huge ash tree still stands. Alfred Austin ends chapter one of his autobiography with this. To close the recollection of my childhood, I may say it was most deeply moved and mainly attracted by nature, music, architectural beauty, and things consecrated by time. Well, these are words I could readily use about myself. Perhaps something steeped into our blood from the sandstone 
of our beloved Ashwood. That's the end of my talk and my thanks go to Alan Slomson and Sue Alexander for help with the technological side of this meeting and also to Anthony Ram who originally organised this booking. Thank you very much everybody. Thank you very much indeed Jane for that most fascinating talk. We have about 10 minutes for anyone who would like to make any comments or ask Jane any questions. While other people are thinking of their question, Jane, I have a question as well. I was interested in your comment that a parody of Austen had been written by the author of The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I'm amazed that an American would have even been sufficiently aware of Alfred Austen to feel the need to write a parody. Do, I, do you know anything I, about that? I don't know enough about L. Frank Baum to know whether he ever resided in England. It would be interesting to find out. But yes. yeah, I don't know is the answer to that one. But certainly he, yes, mercilessly parodied him uh, and very obviously um, used his name, you know, sort of spoonerized his name. So no holds so there barred. There is one question. Okay. Uh, apart from people congratulating on your talk, Jane, in the chat, there was a question. You did mention that the Austins were Roman Catholics and he went to Stony Hill School. I wonder whether you know anything about their involvement in Roman Catholic life in Leeds? Um, I would have to wade through the autobiography again, and it's a very, very difficult read, as I say. I'm sure that he mentions it. But he's also a very frustrating writer in that his autobiography doesn't tell you the facts that you really want to know. It might mention them briefly, but uh, there's a huge fat section of the book, many, many, many pages, where he just quotes what he clearly feels is the best newspaper article he ever wrote. And it's, you know, endless. Um, and you really don't need that in an autobiography. So my, my knowledge of his time at Stonyhurst is scant. Um, and I think he doesn't actually provide much help in the book. Thank you. Uh, any, anybody got any questions for Jane before we end the meeting? A lot of people are congratulating you on your talk, Jane, but, but nobody Thank has thought you. of a question Thank you very yet. much. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed so it. Can we perhaps end, end the meeting there? Thank Jane again for this fascinating talk and then and wish everybody a happy, healthy New Year and a Merry Christmas.